Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming, and thank you for tuning in, those of you who are watching this on Channel 79. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about vaping, the dangers of vaping, and it's intended to be a discussion to foster a conversation between parents and their children. It's been in the news a lot lately, and uh, the fear is it's not going to go away, this issue of vaping. Just recently, the state health department sent out a, uh, a press release, and there's some statistics here that I think everybody should know. So the number of, currently, as, as of the 18th of October, the number of lung, lung injury cases under investigation in Connecticut is at 34. There's a growing body of evidence that shows that vaping and e-cigarette products containing TAC are playing a major role in this disease outbreak. The 34 cases that we that we are identifying in Connecticut, of those 34, 17 are in Fairfield County. Um, in discussions earlier this evening um, with our panelists, who with, you will hear from tonight, there are four in Stanford, and there's been at least one hospitalization from a Darien resident. Um, th there's no particular age group. It, it spans all ages here. There's no body, no, it's not, it doesn't eliminate anybody. Whether it's under 18, 18 to 24, you can see, uh, and older, above 35. At one point, vaping was being promoted as being a way to quit smoking, stop smoking cigarettes. Um, that way you're not getting all the tar. You can get nicotine, but you're not getting the things that may cause lung cancer. So far, in, as of October 15th, as you can see, almost 1,500 cases of vaping-related injuries reported from 49 states, so it's everywhere. 33 deaths confirmed in 24 states. Connecticut has seen one fatality thus far. What do we do about that? How do we address the situation? Well. Vaping's been around for a few years, and the illnesses associated with vaping seems to be more recent. Um, perhaps associated with adding THC to the vaping products, meaning that a lot of these, uh, vape, what they're vaping, is not being bought in a store or being sold by reputable salespeople. Um, <clears throat> So among patients in Connecticut, 26, you know, 26 people reported that they had smoked vaping products that contained THC. So there's a high prevalence of that. Um, so according to our Commissioner of Health, Dr. Renee Coleman Mitchell, she went on to say that as a matter of public health, there's no safe tobacco product and also to advise Please don't vape. <laughs> okay, great. So, the only way to assure that people are not at risk while these, this investigation takes place to find out why people are being injured from vaping is to refrain from all e-cigarette and vaping products. Now, with that, I'd like to turn it over to our pulmonologist, Dr. Paul Sachs. Dr. Sachs practices all aspects of pulmonology medicine, but his passion has been helping his patients become more active and independent through pulmonary rehabilitation. He also enjoys helping motivated patients with their goal of tobacco cessation. Um, he's a clinical preceptor for Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeon Medical Students and has been a principal investigator for numerous clinical trials in pulmonary medicine. Congratulations, Dr. Sachs. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Is this uh, on? Okay. Um, you could just set my. Yep. Okay. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, vaping. Um, and I've given this uh, lecture, uh, unfortunately, more and more frequently. Um, but I had to update it because there's a whole new chapter to the vaping story. I have plenty of reasons why you shouldn't be vaping to begin with. But then you, when you add what happened this past summer, 
it's hit a, a crisis mode that uh, vaping is, is um, clearly dangerous. And I'm going to try to share that with you. So I'm going to run through a little bit just to understand how we got to where we are. You should know that there is still, cigarette smoking is still one of the biggest problems we have in, uh, in this country and worldwide. There are 1.1 billion smokers. In the United States, there's 34 million smokers. There's actually more ex-smokers than there are active smokers now. Back in 1965, 50% of the adult population smoked cigarettes. And it's steadily come down. This shows your graph since 1991. And it's a straight line. And we're doing well, and we're down to 14%, actually less than 14% here in Connecticut. Uh, this is um, high school students um, and cigarette use. And you can see the top line is the, 12 year, uh, the 12th graders, and the um, bottom line is the 8th graders, the middle line is 10th graders. And you can see smoking, tobacco, conventional cigarettes has gone down, down as well over the past few years. You see it in this bar graph looking from 2001 to 2016, you can see any combustibles going down, specifically when you look at the cigarettes, less and less every year. But the problem is here, e-cigarettes have gone up, okay? And this is, e-cigarettes came out in 2007. Um, they were barely on the map in 2010. Um, now every sixth grader you know, knows what a vape is, knows what an e-cigarette is. This is the trend in cigarette use, and this is what's happened in vaping over the past few years. So this is a new phenomenon. It's not something we were dealing with um, you know, 10 years ago or even five years ago. It's really a new phenomenon that we've been dealing with over the past three, four years. Okay. From 2017 to 2018, the amount of, of vaping has gone way up. If you look at high school um, um, students, it went up by 78%. And if you look at middle school students, it went up by 50% over one year. Okay, And remember this date, 2017 to 2018, because it, it's important when we talk about what the FDA is doing about this. Okay. So this used to be the face of nicotine addiction, and now it's changed to this and this. So this is, there's a whole generation of students now who are becoming nicotine addicted from vaping and e-cigarettes. I should just say to make it clear, vaping, e-cigarettes, same exact thing. There's no difference between them. This is a typical e-cigarette. This is how it works. To the left is the battery. This is the battery compartment. There's a little light that goes on when somebody inhales on this side. This is a microprocessor. This is where the, the action is. This is nicotine dispensed usually in propylene glycol. Okay, and when the person inhales on this, the, it, it, it um, vaporizes the nicotine and the propylene glycol, and that's what's inhaled. So when you see vaping, it looks like steam. It's not steam, it's not water. It's propylene glycol in, mo in most cases that is being inhaled and then exhaled. There are many different looks. On the far right, you see they, they, when they first came out, they were trying to make them look like cigarettes. And then over the years, they've gotten bigger. They're rechargeable. Um, they're refillable. And there are some large tanks that are refillable. Um, and then there's even e-cigars e e and e-pipes. <coughs> this is the Juul. The Juul is the, by far the most popular um, e-cigarette out there. Um, it's high tech. It's slick. It looks like a USB <coughs> stick. It charges in the computer laptop. Um, and they are you know, very, very popular. There are lots of others. There's other brands. 
Um, and um, later you'll see that uh, they don't always look as obvious as this, okay? There, there, there are, are e-cigarette um, um, uh, mechanisms that will surprise you. And I don't want to steal thunder of our next speaker, but um, you'll see they don't always look as obvious as a, as a stick like this. Okay. So e-cigarettes, when they first came out, they were touted as being a way for people who smoke conventional cigarettes to stop smoking that they'd switch to an e-cigarette instead and give up regular cigarettes, and maybe they get their nicotine that way, which you know, wasn't a bad thought, because when we try to get people to stop smoking, we give them what? A nicotine patch, we give them a nicotine gum. A nicotine cigarette that doesn't have tar and a lot of the other chemicals. When you smoke a, a cigarette, there are 7,000 chemicals. Um, in an e-cigarette, there are maybe 40 chemicals. Um, so you know, it's, it's a lot less chemical intake, but those 40 chemicals are still a problem. Um, I'm sorry, so it was brought on as a, as a less harmful alternative to smoking, but it turns out that over time, there's been no evidence to show that e-cigarettes help people stop smoking. So although it came out that way, or was touted that way when it hit the market, there's never been studies to show that e-cigarettes successfully help people quit smoker, smoking. And actually, what's happening is people are doing both. They may go to an e-cigarette initially to try to stop smoking, but what we're finding is that they're becoming dual users, and they're smoking their regular cigarettes where they can, and you know, nowadays a, a smoker feels like a leper and there's not many places they could smoke. But now with an e-cigarette, there are other places that they can smoke where you don't smell it, and you know, maybe it's not as uh, adverse to the public you know, as far as them recognizing it. Um, and they're finding that people are becoming more addicted when they s try to, quote, switch to e-cigarettes because now they're smoking both. We call them dual users, okay? And the FDA has never approved any of these um, uh, modes as being a, a way of stopping um, cigarettes. Yet the companies that make these have advertisements out there that uh, imply that it's gonna help you stop smoking. Um, you know, stop with an e-cigarette, switch to blue, um, I've made the switch. Um, they're, they're, they're these advertisements that are, are false, okay, and they're implying they're gonna get people to stop smoking, but there's no science behind it. And because this whole field is not regulated well, um, there is little that up until now that could be done to stop this type of advertising. And you know, for you know, maybe our generation or, or our parents' generation, there are all these advertisements for smoking showing glamorous movie stars. This was an old Joan Crawford uh, slide um, advertising cigarettes, and now they have Jenny McCarthy advertising e-cigarettes. It's the same, you know, um, page out of out of uh, Big Tobacco's playbook. You know, they had uh, James Arness from Gunsmoke Gun um, suggesting that you smoke cigarettes, and now they have, I had to look up who he is, Stephen Dorff from Blade. I don't know if anybody knows who he is. Um, but it's the same, like a rugged guy, you know, switching to uh, e-cigarettes. And they're, they're marketing it to teens. They're marketing it to youths, and they say they're not, but the flavors are, are cotton candy, bubble gum, gummy bear, Vanilla wafers, these are actual, real uh, nicotine-containing products that are supposed to be for adults to stop smoking. You know, it's, it's silly you know, how, 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 how obvious and how transparent you know, this, this is being misleading. You know, they have, they're not marketing to youth, this is great. At the bottom here, you may not see it, but it says, not for sale to minors. You know, how old are these kids in this slide? You know, so you know, they're clearly advertising directly to minors. You know, it, they, the, these jewels have you know wraps that look like you know Captain Crunch or or uh, uh, South Park or Pokemon. You know, you know, you can't tell me this is you're trying to get a you know a, a 35 year old man to stop smoking c cigarettes. You know, when you have this type of marketing going on. 
Altria is the father, is the, um, the parent company to uh, Philip Morris that makes Marlboro. And something very telling is they just spent $13 billion to be a one-third shareholder of Juul. So, you know, the, the company that makes cigarettes is putting $13 billion into this company that's supposed to get people to stop smoking cigarettes? Doesn't really sound like that makes sense. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is a big problem. Okay, so what are the risks of e-cigarettes? Well, nicotine, when you're smoking a, a e-cigarette, is probably the biggest risk, okay? Nicotine is one of the most addictive substances on the planet. This was a, a interesting slide I, I found that talks about people who are exposed to certain products and who gets addicted. So alcohol, maybe 92% of the population is exposed to, a little under 14% might wind up getting addicted. And you can look at the others, pot, cocaine, drugs. Tobacco, they say 76% of the population in some, part, in some part of their life will try tobacco and 24% get addicted. It's a highly addictive drug. I've taken care of patients who've been addicted to heroin and addicted to cigarettes and stopping heroin was easier than stopping cigarettes. In the brain, we have a receptor, that we'll call it a nicotine receptor, and when that gets stimulated, there's a release of something called dopamine in the forebrain, in the front of the brain. So when there's a stimulation here, a chemical called dopamine is given out, and that's a, a pleasure sense, it's a, a satisfaction, it's a, it's a reward. Okay, and it takes seven seconds from the puff of a cigarette or the puff of an e-cigarette for that nicotine to get to the brain and the dopamine to fire. It's a very efficient nicotine delivery system. And then you have this cycle of addiction where you have these nicotine receptors that are basically saying, feed me, feed me. And if you don't, you get cranky and irritable. But when you do, you get more of these you know, hungry nicotine receptors. And the cycle goes on and on. And nicotine is addictive no matter where you get it from. If it's a gar, if it's a hookah, if it's uh, any of these electron, electronic nicotine devices, e-cigarettes, vapes, jewels, et cetera. Okay. When you survey teenagers and ask them what's in that vape you're using or what's in that cigarette you're using, most of them don't know there's nicotine in it. Most of them think it's just flavoring. A small percentage realize there's nicotine in it. And then some people say, well, I'm smoking nicotine-free vapes. What if I had a vape that has no nicotine in it? You know, why you do that, I don't know, but is that safe? So you have these, these companies out there who are not regulated, who are writing down that they are nicotine free, zero nicotine, and then a study was done, this was done in Australia where they looked at these products and they found the, um, they tested 10 nicotine free liquids and found six of them had nicotine. So you know they could say it's nicotine free, but most of them do have nicotine in them anyway. It's not regulated, it's, it's the wild west out there. So they're just saying these things and there are people who come to me and say, it's okay, I'm smoking a nicotine free vape, um, but you know, it's not, you don't know what you're getting. Okay, so it's addictive. There's also been nicotine overdoses. What's happening is these, you know, these look like candy and there are three-year-olds and four-year-olds that are swallowing these. And the number of calls to the poison control center has you know, shot out of control from nicotine overdoses, mostly from people drinking what looks like candy, little kids. Um, there are other chemicals in the vape other than nicotine. So I mentioned before, propylene glycol was you know, what is making that vape, but propylene glycol is metabolized into formaldehyde, which is embalming fluid, and acid, acid aldehyde, acid aldehyde um, two chemicals you really don't want in your body. These are other chemicals that are found in vapes. This is not cigarettes now. Cigarettes, I said, had 7,000 chemicals. 
Vapes and e-cigarettes have about 40 chemicals. These are some of them. The ones that are in bold with asterisks are known carcinogens, okay? So we know that there are these, you know, look, if you're not breathing in air, you know, you gotta wonder what it is. So these are, are um, chemicals and heavy metals that are in there, not put in on purpose, it's just part of the manufacturing. They're not trying to hurt people, but you know, this is what's happening when they're putting these, these things together in unregulated circumstances. And there are a lot of dangerous products in these vapes. Okay. There is no long-term safety data. I mean, like I said, they came out in 2007. They really only became popular over the past you know, five years or so. So we really don't know what happens if you smoke an e-cigarette or a vape for 10 years or 15 years or, or longer. We just don't have that data yet. Uh, we know short-term, People come in with coughing, and if they have asthma, it could aggravate asthma. Um, we know there are carcinogens in there. We don't have to wait 25 years to show that, yes, this person got cancer, and it was, they did smoke an e-cigarette for 25 years, therefore, we, we know it's a carcinogen. You know, we know it's a cancer-causing uh, uh, molecule that's in some of these vapes. These are, you know, vapes in general. Oh, then there's the whole flavoring story. You've heard of popcorn lung, maybe? Um, diacetyl is a, is a flavoring they put in to make things buttery. So it's in uh, you know, the butter flavor, it's in the cherry flavor. But diacetyl, it turns out, can cause a problem in the lung. It's called bronchiolitis obliterans. It's a scarring in the lung, a very bad lung disease. It's called popcorn lung because they discovered this in a, uh, a microwave pack popcorn factory where they were using this chemical diacetyl, and eight of the employees there developed this bronchiolitis obliterans. So it's not like you're getting popcorn in your lungs. It's called popcorn lung because that's where it was lo that's where it was identified. But it's this chemical that's in your you know cherry flavored or butter flavored um, vapes. Okay, it's also the, 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 one of the big problems is that the vapes are now. Um, containing marijuana. And some of these are legal in you know, Massachusetts and California, for example. Um, and many of them are not legal. Um, just people are putting these concoctions together um, you know, in garages and other uh, you know, bootleg areas. Um, and it doesn't really smell, it doesn't have that odor of THC that you used to with combustibles. Um, so it's, it's, it's been very popular uh, as a way to, um, you know, maybe more uh, inconspicuously um, smoke pot, okay? Other risks of e-cigarettes is that it's renormalizing smoking. I mean, we grew up with these signs. We were familiar with you can't smoke in certain places. And we've seen airports where you have these you know, terrariums that you put smokers in because you, you don't want them smoking in public. And you know, we're sort of used to seeing this. And being a smoker feels like a leper many times. And you feel uh, you know, there's no place you could go. But now with the vaping, you know, there's a little more um, people trying to get out there and, and do it a little more in public. So you'll see a lot of signs like this going forward, you know, no combustibles, no e-cigarettes. But, you know, this is a big political issue. Big tobacco is, is huge, and they fight everything. Every time there's a ruling with the FDA, every time there's a regulation, they sue, and they, they bog it down for years in court. So, you know, they have, they've, they've supported this group um, called um, Stop the Ban, um, writing letters and trying to, you know, fight, you know, against uh, any restrictions about vaping, you know, assuming that, you know, vaping is your right, and you have a right to vape, and you you should fight for your right. Okay. There's also the concern that it's a gateway to conventional cigarettes. So this is you know, one study that looked at um, students who smoked um, and over the past six months had they used an e-cigarette or not. And it was a four-time likelihood that people, that students would smoke had they used e-cigarettes in the past six months. Now, it's a little hard. Maybe that kid who went to an e-cigarette might have gone to a regular cigarette anyway. Maybe, yeah, it, it's, it's not a pure study, but there certainly seems to be an um, increased likelihood of starting with a uh, e-cigarette um, way of taking in nicotine and then progressing to regular cigarettes. And we're seeing a lot of that. I'm seeing that in the office. 
So are they safe? Okay, so the Surgeon General came out in 2016 with a report on e-cigarettes. And the conclusion was that it's a major health concern and that the brains of, of adolescents are different than adults and that taking in nicotine at a young age could have significant impact later in life, more so than a 25-year-old, for example, starting to use nicotine. And the conclusion was that we know that they're not harmless. And, you know, it's funny, we, we talk about, not funny, uh, but it, it, we talk about e-cigarettes being safer than cigarettes. And that's probably true, 7,000 chemicals versus 50 chemicals or 40 chemicals. But that's a pretty low bar to try to be better than, okay, we're safer than cigarettes. I mean, you know, that's, that's not a very uh, difficult thing to come out and say. Um, but they're not safe. But the, the um, advertisers, you know, for vaping and all that, you know, are taking safer and implying that it's safe. And safer and safe are very different. Now, this is kind of where the, lecture used to you know, transition into what can we do about, about people who are vaping and how can we help people stop vaping. Um, but over this past summer, there's been a change. Something has happened. And we can talk about what that might be. But this was in New England Journal September 6th. So this just you know last month. There was a description of 53 patients uh, in Illinois and Wisconsin um, who had this vape-related lung injury. And somebody who was observant noticed that patients were coming in with this diffuse lung disease. So this is the heart, this is the spine, this is the uh, one lung, this is the other. The normal lung is here and here, and all this hazy stuff is diseased lung. And somebody noticed that this was happening in young people and took the, the uh, you know, meticulousness to take the history and put together that these were all vapors. So this article came out, and now physicians are, are looking for it, and we're, we're seeing more of it. Um, we've seen at Stanford Hospital four and possibly five cases, um, all young people coming in with this, what we're, what's being called EVALI. EVALI stands for e-cigarette or vaping-associated lung injury, okay? And there's 1,500 cases. This is updated last week. CDC updates their statistics every Thursday. So tomorrow, I'm sure this number will be more, unfortunately. There have been 33 deaths. There was one death in Connecticut. Um, the majority of these people are under 35 years old, and many of them are under 18 years old, okay? And the commonality is that they're all vaping. But what are they vaping? This is uh, just a map looking at, at cross-section. The, 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 the highest um, uh, incidence is in California and Illinois. Uh, Connecticut is, is listed as kind of a medium incident. But it's really across the country. 49 states, Alaska is the only one that hasn't had it yet. So when you look at what they're vaping, okay, is you know, you're asking, so we're going in and asking these patients very detailed questions about, you know, vaping. Are they vaping nicotine? Are they vaping THC? Are they vaping both? Um, are they vaping from a, a e-pen? Are they using a reservoir? Are they using cartridges? Are they using a, an, a, a dropper to refill their e-cigarettes? Where are they getting that from? Are they getting it you know, are they going to Massachusetts or California? Are they getting it from somebody on the street? Um, all these questions we're trying to gather and put together. Um, and so far, the CDC has found that 79% are THC involved, some of them nicotine or not. 10% of them are, ex they're saying exclusively nicotine. And that number has been questioned because the most difficult part, I've done this history, when you're asking somebody about vaping, they'll admit quickly to vaping cigarettes, and they won't admit that quickly to vaping THC. And sometimes it's my second visit or my third visit where they open up and they feel more comfortable about it. So, you know, the, the feeling is that it's predominantly THC, but the CDC can't say yet if it might be nicotine as well. And they're not saying it's nicotine or the THC itself, it might be something that it's, it's mixed in. So, 
it's often coming from these secondary markets. So most of these histories, um, I'm not saying it's safe to do this, but most of these histories are not somebody going in and buying a jewel. Um, it's somebody who's getting a jewel pod replacement from their buddy on the street or you know, from a uh, online. Um, or the THC replacements, um, you know, they're, they're not um, the ones that are coming directly from a dispensary in California. Not that they're regulated so well, but it's when you talk about, you know, the secondary markets, it's really the Wild West out there. There's bootleg, there's people doing these, you know, uh, uh, concoctions. And the feeling is that it, it's, it might be the oils that are being put in to um, cut the product. So there are oils like the vitamin E oil or coconut oil that you know, might be safe to put on your skin um, and might be safe to swallow, but are not safe to inhale. And what's happening is uh, in many of these products, they're finding this oil in the THC pod or in the nicotine pod and it's a way of increasing profit, basically, by diluting um, the product that you're um, giving the consumer. Um, and these inhaling an oil is very inflammatory to the lung. And when you inhale an oil, you get something that's called a lipoid pneumonia, L-I-P-O-I-D pneumonia. And it presents, this is a normal lung, and it could present with all these different chest x-rays. These are three different patients. It could be asymmetric, it could be uh, patchy, um, but all the white cloudy areas that you're seeing are diseased lung. This is normal lung, diseased lung. Normal lung, diseased lung. Patchy, diseased lung. And the symptoms they're coming in with are shortness of breath, which you might imagine from looking at, at that CAT scan, cough, chest pain, GI symptoms, it's really not explained why they're coming in with so much in the way of nausea, vomiting, weight loss, fever, fatigue, and if they have that history, we should be asking whether they've been vaping or not, okay? And if you have you know, questions about a family member or someone who has those symptoms, you should talk to your doctor, and the CDC has a phone number you could call, CDC Info, and they'll answer questions as well. The big problem that's coming up is that flu season's coming. And what are the symptoms of the flu? Well, shortness of breath, cough, nausea, fever, fatigue, everything that's listed there. So, and with the flu, you can't get infiltrates in the lung. So we're gonna see, we know we're gonna see patients who have the flu and happen to vape, and we're not gonna know if that's vape-induced lung injury or not. There's no way to tell unless you go in and do a invasive procedure taking a biopsy of the lung and looking at it, which we're not gonna be doing unless patients are critically ill, but it's gonna be very complicated. So once the flu season hits, it's really gonna be a problem. So everybody should be getting a flu shot unless you have a contraindication. Age six months and up, you should be getting a flu shot, and that will help sort this out you know, if, if less people are getting the flu. But, you know, we're anticipating this and there'll be a lot more questions once flu season starts and people have these symptoms. Okay, so how do you know if someone is vaping, okay? Sometimes it's a, uh, it doesn't smell like cigarettes and it doesn't smell like pot. It may smell like bubble gum. It may smell like watermelon. It may smell like cotton candy. You know, it may smell like um, you know some uh, cream somebody might put on on their face or, or or lipstick. So if you're smelling something that you don't usually smell, um, don't assume it's bubble gum or cotton candy. Uh, you might want to look into it. Okay. <coughs> These vapes are very um, it's, it's um, they're very drying. Okay, so mouths get dry. And they, uh, if, you, if your, your student or your child is, is more thirsty than usual, you might think about, are they vaping? Um, when your tongue is dry, you don't taste as much. So if you see your child putting a lot more salt on or putting uh, you know, a lot more pepper or whatever, you know, sriracha, um, it, that, that could be a sign that they're not tasting as well. Um, dry, dryness causes nosebleeds, dryness worsens acne. Um, 
it, sometimes when patients are, or people are, are vaping nicotine, they get a little hyper, they get a little wired, and they back off on the coffee. So you know, if, if they usually get their Starbucks on the way to school and they're not doing that anymore, also just might be a subtle clue. Um, irritability from either withdrawal or too much nicotine. Um, difficulty sleeping. I mean, <laughs> some of these things is that you know every teenager is going to be hard to, to sort out uh, if they're irritable and 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 uh, have changing sleep patterns. But um, these are just some general guidelines. Um, and then particularly if you see odd things in the house, cotton balls like that where you don't usually see them, or funny charges, you need to ask. And again, our next speaker is going to talk about some of these clues and what you could look for. So what's the FDA doing about this? So back in 2009, Obama signed um, the Tobacco Control Act, which let the FDA regulate cigarettes and smokeless tobacco. This is 2009. E-cigarettes came out in 2007. E-cigarettes were not included in the, t t in the Tobacco Control Act. They were considered a device at that time, and they weren't that popular, and it wasn't really in the spotlight the way it is now. In 2016, the FDA, it's called, they, they, they deemed um, that the, they now have authority over all products, including e-cigarettes. And that's when we saw can't, can't um, sell nationally e-cigarettes to anybody under 18. No more free samples. They were giving free samples like they did with cigarettes in the old days. Um, health warnings to say there's nicotine in this product. All these things that you've seen have come in 2016. The, the most important one is they demanded a pre-market review that before anybody could put a new product out there, there would have to be science offered that talks about the health risk and backs up any claims. If they say it's going to help stop smoking cigarettes, they have to show a study where it helps stop smoking. If they say it's safe, they have to do a study looking at, at the safety of it. They have to include the ingredients. Okay, so this was 2016. In 2017, the FDA postponed that pre-market review from 2018 to 2022. Okay, and the reasoning from the FDA was we want to do this right. E-cigarettes may be helping people stop smoking. We don't want to take e-cigarettes off the market. And now you have people who are trying to stop conventional smoking going to probably a safer e-cigarette, and we don't want to discourage that, so let's like back off and do it right. But then if you remember the slide I showed you earlier, 2017 to 2018, that was that, you know, taking off of e-cigarette use in youth. So they backtracked on this. And actually as of May, what happened was seven health groups, the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, American Lung Association, American Heart Association, um, they sued the FDA in federal court in Maryland and won. And they pushed this review date up to May 2020, which is better than you know two years later. Now, of course, the very next day, Big Tobacco sued or, or filed an appeal, um, and this is being held up in the courts. And this is what's happening every step of the way. But the FDA is trying to now get on the stick. They're under a lot of pressure um, to try to be a little more proactive about getting out there and, and you know, getting uh, the, the safety um, issue um, understood. Um, this is nationally. Um, the FDA launches this campaign called uh, The Real Cost of Smoking, of, of e-cigarettes. Um, they have these, uh, you know, advertisements out there. Um, but what they need to do, they need to eliminate all flavors, okay? The flavors are the main reason um, teens start uh, vaping, okay? The flavors are the main reasons. And the, the tobacco companies are very hesitant to give up on the flavors, especially mint and methyl. menthol. Those are the two prime um, uh, flavors that teens are going to. You want to ban all online sales. You can get these things online. This is, I went to a website. You know, you have to say, am I 21? Yes, I'm 21, and you're in. I mean, that's the safety check they have on, on getting these things. And you get these things delivered to your house. They need to decrease marketing to kids, stop the advertisements. Um, they have to talk, stop claiming that they're safe. Um, and we have to get the pre-market review done as soon as possible. Now, this has been very frustrating because it's federal and it's big tobacco and it's lawsuits. In some countries, they just banned 
e-cigarettes, okay? They just don't have them. There's no vaping nationally. Um, the United States is not one of those countries. So locally, things are being done. Um, for example, in Massachusetts, they banned all vaping products for the next four months to try to you know, get some science and understand what's going on and see where the problem is. Um, you know, California did some, you know, some cities in California. Um, in Connecticut, they just raised the age that you could buy um, e-cigarettes from 18 to 21. What's that? In Connecticut. In Connecticut. In Connecticut, just went from 18 to 21. Right. Okay. Um, what are they doing in the schools? Um, they're putting uh, cameras in the bathrooms. They're taking the doors off the bathroom. Um, they're you know sending people. You know, teachers are being posted in the bathroom um, because you almost have to catch them doing it because you know, it doesn't smell. You know, they could you know breathe you know into their into their sleeve, um, and you didn't see them do it. So um, it's almost you have to catch them red-handed. Um, there are, there are um, vape detectors that in some schools are putting in that you know in the bathroom they could sense the uh, vape and that goes to the uh, principal's office. Um, there is a a um, a program out there called Catch My Breath, which is a, a, a four 30-minute lectures for student, for teachers. I don't know if any teachers in the audience would, are aware of this. Um, and they are um, you know, teaching, first educating teachers about the problem, and then educating the, uh, the students about it. And it's interactive with the students. So I'll ask at the end maybe if anybody's seen any of this. OK. Now, the big question that comes up, yeah, you have a question. Um, is Darianne like maybe like one of the top ten who like kids and like DHS and like Middlesex like vape? Is like Darianne known for like kids vaping? Uh, uh, Fairfield County is. I don't I don't know the breakdown between cities, but you know that's that's a problem. That's you know that's you know that's kind of why we're here. Um, so, so people want to know sometimes how to stop vaping. Okay, so I'll say that the. Current tobacco cessation techniques, behavioral modification, taking nicotine patches and all that, they're not approved for kids. They've never been studied in kids. They're not approved for somebody under 18. Doctors could write a prescription of something that's not FDA approved, but we're not really sure. We're talking about a smoker who is uh, under 18. We don't know if this works for vapors who are under 18, okay? So it's, it's very unclear what to do. We have ideas of what to do, and it kind of makes sense what we do in adults, we should probably do for, for teens, but really don't have the science to say it because there haven't been enough you know, studies done that look at 17-year-olds who are vaping and want to stop and trying behavioral modification versus patch versus Chantix or whatever. So, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. So, you know, these are the things that some people try to wean the strength of the nicotine, maybe nicotine replacement therapy, maybe some of these medications, which again, are not approved for people under 18, but we can write for that if we feel it's, at, it's uh, indicated, and possibly cold turkey or a combination of those. So lastly, I'll just say there are a couple of, of websites uh, and um, uh, um, texting apps that are available. This is one where you text quit to this phone number, 202 Four nine eight eight four, and there's an interactive uh, um, app that will help with coaching with um, quitting uh, nicotine use uh, through a vape. Um, there is one called Quit Jewel, um, where you text um, Ditch Jewel to eight eight seven zero nine, and there's an interactive uh, app there to try to help. Uh, we have a program at Stanford Hospital called Commit to Quit. It was designed for adults, but we're getting more and more um, requests from um, teens and parents of teens uh, to try to help with smoking cessation. So we're available, and there are actually some flyers out there if you're interested. 
Um, you need to educate yourself that there are a lot of myths out there. You know, my, you know that there are no nicotine-free vapes, and that um, you know smoking and you know vaping um, could lead to uh, conventional cigarette use. And it's not just flavoring, and it's not just water vapor. Um, there are websites, uh, Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes, Pave, Vape Enders, Quit Vaping, Smoke Free Teen. One of the best ones I've seen is this, the Truth Initiative. If you're going to go to one site, I would go there. Um, they, they have a, a lot of information about teens and vaping. And with that, I'm going to stop. So thank you for your attention. Should I take a question now? Sure. Yeah. So I feel confused. So is it more unhealthy to vape or smoke cigarettes? Okay, so the question is, is what's healthier, smoking cigarettes or vaping? Up until this summer, with this whole this. issue that came up, I would have said that vaping is not safe. If it's one or the other, I think vaping alone, not becoming a dual user, right. If you could vape alone as opposed to smoke conventional cigarettes, that vaping is not safe, I'll say it again, but it's safer than smoking cigarettes, yes. Now, with what's going on with the, the, uh, uh, the scare that, that we're seeing, um, the recommendation, you know, it's easy to say, is don't vape. And there's concern, there's concern for people who are vaping and telling them not to vape that now they may go to conventional cigarettes because we're telling them all to not vape. You know, the health effects of cigarettes, you know, you, know, you see years later. This we're seeing, the E-Valley, we're seeing acutely. So which do you do? I mean, right now, I, I definitely would not vape. I have one other question, slightly unrelated, but you said that they think it's part, the oils are part of what is actually also making people sick, right? Okay. So like, I feel like essential oils, like. Those are very popular right now, just to like put in your house and basically they steam. Right. Is that also uh, actually? That's okay. So the question is about the oil. So what I said is that what they think the CDC thinks is going on is that oils are being used to cut the product in secondary markets to improve profit for these people, and yet those in, those oils when they're going to, when they're being vaped, they're heated to very high levels and then they're inhaled, there are still some oil liquid products that are not completely vaporized and going into the lungs causing this. So then if you have essential oils around the house and just, just you know, you're not, you're not standing over that device and sucking it in. It's just like a, a scent that's in the air. That has not been implicated to be a problem. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it's been looked at, but that has not been implicated. I wouldn't, I wouldn't really worry about that. It's, it's the vaping and heating it up and sucking it in that seems to be the problem. Thank you very much, Dr. Sachs. Thank you, Thank you again. Take questions at the end, so we'll have a panel. But uh, you know, one of the big success stories, one of the big success stories for public health until the last few years has been the decline of smoking, cigarette smoking in particular. Um, we thought we were doing a good job because cigarette smoking rates were going way down, and I think our school surveys have shown that yeah. cigarette smoking went down. But all of a sudden, this vaping craze has swept Next. the country, and uh, with that, I would like to introduce Detective Jason Mulberry of the Dairy and Police Department, who's had quite a lot of experience with vaping, with students vaping, and is going to show us what some of these vaping devices look like. James, thank you. Would you like this? No, that's okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is James Palmieri. I, I'm a detective with the Darien Police Department. Uh, I've been doing, I've been working with kids for most of my police career. So that's sort of why I end up standing in front of you uh, talking about this stuff. Um, so you were, we just came from a level that's way over my head. So we're going to come down to, to, to my level, which is I'm going to talk about what we do as police, which is detection and enforcement. And uh, the doctor hit on a few of the issues that we have. But one of the things that I think that people forget is we're law enforcement, right? What's the first word in law enforcement? Law. 
a lot of this stuff is moving so fast that we don't have the laws to enforce. Uh, the doctor alluded to the changing of the ages now. We actually just got a law October 1st. Every year on October 1st, the laws in Connecticut that have been voted on go into effect. October 1st, we finally got a law that we can enforce with kids just having vapes. Because before that, everything was sort of a, you know, it, the word, the phrase tobacco product is in a lot of the laws. And also, I, I happen to know from personal experience, the high school went through the same problem because all their policies use the phrase tobacco product. There's no tobacco in a vape. So just as, as local board of eds are dealing with it, the state legislature is dealing with that. So we're just now getting laws for that stuff. Um, for example, something that another thing people may not think about, when we arrest somebody for possession of marijuana, it literally says green leaf, leafy substance in the, in the um, statute. So now we have a vape cartridge with THC oil in it, which I'll talk about in a minute. What are we charging this person with? Um, there's certain weights that we're supposed to, you know, when you have a certain weight, it gets more serious. Are we weighing these things just on a scale? I, I, the point I'm trying to make is we're playing catch up and trying to do the best we can with the laws that we have on the books today. Um, that being said, I just wanted to do sort of a little demonstration about, um, like the doctor sort of talked about, and I'm going to have to step away from the mic for a second. The detection part for us has been really frustrating. And, and you know, I don't get into marijuana laws and what people's concerns are, but I would, I would make the, the parallel to alcohol, right? Alcohol is completely legal if you're over 21. Does that mean you want your 12 year old doing it? No, absolutely not, obviously. So we're gonna sort of go down that path. Me, I'm gonna take the stance of nobody wants their 12 and 13 and 14, 15 year old ingesting THC. If it's gonna be legal in three years, we'll deal with it in three years, but nobody thinks that that is safe, I'm gonna guess, in this room. So the detection part for us, it used to be, um, and I know some of you may have never seen this stuff, but it was a little easier for us to detect marijuana use um, with kids because we were looking for these big pipes and uh, I got more stuff in here. You know, if you had marijuana, you had to grind it up, so we would always find these little grinders in kids' cars and um, you know, maybe you get the, the tobacco, the um, rolling papers scattered all around the car. Um, more grinders, the one hitters, you know, things like this. So the, again, the point I'm trying to make here is we had all this stuff that could potentially be a clue to us that a kid was in possession of marijuana. And marijuana, like people sometimes call it the gateway drug for kids, cops sort of call it the gateway drug because as we all know in this room, Marijuana stinks, right? If you smoke marijuana in your car and I pull you over for running a stop sign, I'm gonna know in two seconds that you have marijuana in that car. That's our gateway without getting into a lot of legal mumbo jumbo to search a car. Now take away that odor. And again, there's usually other things potentially that go along with marijuana that are bad. You know, cocaine, any other drug. Take away that smell from us, right? There's no smell anymore. There's none of this laying around the car. Um, the, the, the odor, the smoke isn't coming out. We're not, we're not seeing the pipes with the, the residue all over them. So now we're pulling that car over and every kid in that car could be in possession of THC, but we're not smelling it, so we have no legal authority to search anybody in the car. And we're not seeing any of the normal clues that we see. So we went from a bag of weed and, and a pipe or a, a one hitter, I'm, I know I'm not holding them up very high, you know, all these things that everybody knows are marijuana consuming products. Now we're going to, I've had it in my pocket the whole time, here's your marijuana and here's your pipe. This is how big, and this is a little on the bigger side to be honest with you, this is how big the things that we're looking for are. Is it easier for me to find this, all this stinky smelly stuff and easier for you to find all this stinky smelly stuff in your kid's bedroom or find this that has absolutely zero smell? I can be honest with you and tell you that this is really tough for us and it's tough for the schools and it's tough for parents. So I think a, a lot of times with this stuff and, and the marijuana and the THC stuff, and I'm not, I, I'm not even really gonna touch on just nicotine vapes because I think that sort of was, was touched on enough in the presentation. We all think nicotine's bad. I'm talking about the THC stuff. This stuff, uh, you know, I have one here that says coconut mango. This is an oil. Now this particular oil is not, does not contain THC. I actually don't have any that actually does. Here's the problem with the THC stuff. It used to be, again, that your kid had to go to school, or not, not necessarily school, but they had to go where other kids were and, and make these risky drug transactions with this smelly bag of weed. Now your kid's asking you for an Amazon gift card for their birthday and going on Amazon and buying this. 
and having it sent to maybe not your house, but their friend's house whose mother or parents aren't maybe there that much. So consider giving your kids that Amazon gift card because they can get all this stuff, like the doctor said, online. So now that your kids are getting this so easily, not only can get, they get this online, but from states like Colorado, they get the shipments of the THC oil, literally in the mail, to the front step of your house, and you may not know anything about it, again, through these gift cards or going onto these websites. Um, for example, we had a, a young man that I knew all through high school, um, graduated Darien High School, um, floundered a little bit for a couple of years. He made quite a killing in the town of Darien selling to Darien kids. Um, he would buy this juice and he would buy THC oil from Colorado and take a syringe and pull the THC oil out and make his own little concoctions in the cartridges and sell those to kids for ridiculous amounts of money. We ended up taking, uh, we got a search warrant for his house and taking hundreds of these homemade cartridges out. I mean, this, this guy was running a big business in town because again, it's so easy to make these exchanges with this stuff. It's so easy to get to, it's so non, Descript and, and 90, or I, I shouldn't say that, it's getting better. I'm gonna say 65% of parents don't, if, if I showed you this or I was just holding it in my hand, you would have absolutely no idea what I was holding versus if I walked down the street and I was holding this. You just gotta know what you're looking for and you gotta understand that it's not gonna be that telltale stinky smoke that you know your kids, that, that you grew up with or that I grew up with. It's, it's completely different. And like the doctor said, 90% of the times, they're not, you can't go to a store in Connecticut and buy a, a, a controlled THC cartridge that also has uh, coconut mango oil in it or blueberry and have it mixed with THC and know that it's safe and it's clean and it's, you're, you're trusting that kid, again from Darien, that's using some dirty syringe to pull THC oil out and refill used nicotine cartridges, so now you're getting a little bit of nicotine in with this blueberry oil and THC oil, and your kid's putting it in the end of this thing and breathing it in. And now, we're all worried about the nicotine ones. I, I can tell you again that if, a, if your child or, or me stood in front of you and smoked, took a big breath of the nicotine and blew it on you, and then took a big breath of the one with THC and blew it on you, it smells the same. It's tough, it's tough for the, again, tough for the schools because the, the fact that this, kid, you know, kids aren't, they're pretty quick with things, so they know that they can get away with certain things with this. It's a pretty big risk to go into a school or, or a, a library and start smoking weed, but I can guarantee that in just about most buildings in town, there has been some kid that had a vape pen, different kind of vape pen maybe, up his sleeve like this, and in the middle of studying, was taking hits of THC oil and blowing it back into his sleeve and nobody is the wiser. I mean, I, I'm not saying I know this for a fact, but you could do it in class. I know kids have used vapes in class. You know, it's kind of cool when your teacher turns around, you're the kid that blows smoke in the air. Real cool. But it's, it, again, it's the detection of this stuff that makes it difficult for us. And we didn't, again, we didn't know for a while what we were dealing with as far as the laws were concerned. So it was tougher for us to find. We didn't know really what we were doing as far as the laws were concerned, on top of all the health risks that we're talking about. Um, I, I'd say that's our biggest challenge from a police perspective is, is the loss of that really super obvious stuff to this, these little things that could lay around your house and really be hidden anywhere. Um, I know I worked in the school for five years. Again, they're, they're, they're facing a real uphill battle. I, I mean, if you, if you listen to any kid, they'll tell you that, and I'll, I don't pick on the school, I just know, I, I don't, whenever I mention the high school, I try to make this disclaimer. It's not because of that building or anybody that's in that building, it's because that's where your kids are during the day. They're all together, that's where they're gonna do their stuff. It could be anywhere, it just happens to be Darien High School because you live in Darien. So if you talk to your kids, you're gonna find out that this stuff goes on a lot. And uh, just like we're having trouble with the detection, the high school is having trouble with detection. Um, Shelly was just saying that there, I, I had heard that Greenwich had put these detectors in the bathrooms and uh, the kids basically defiled them and broke them so that they didn't work. Um, like a couple examples you gave, taking the, taking the bathroom doors off or putting cameras in the bathroom. People used to ask me, you know, from sort of another perspective, a school safety perspective, you know, why aren't you putting uh, cameras in the locker room? You know, there's a lot of theft that goes on there, people stealing calculators. And I would say back, would you be comfortable with me watching your 15-year-old daughter get changed for lacrosse 
just to make sure she doesn't lose her calculator. So there's a lot there with the bathroom doors and the cameras. It's not as simple as you think it's going to be. Yeah. Is there actually stuff in those you're holding right now? This, yes. Oh, wow. This, yes. Oh. Some of them were working for a while. I think the batteries are probably dead, though. Sorry, what was the question? Oh, sorry. He said, uh, is there actual stuff in here? And I said, oh, yes. Got it. Um, these, are, these are things that we've taken from kids. Um, i got a whole bag of them. After the presentation, if anybody wants to come up and see them any closer, I'm guessing most of you know what these are, so those aren't so interesting. Um, I, if I could give you any advice, I would just say, listen to the, the clues the doctor gave you about the, the sweet smell, and don't believe them that it's incense. Nobody burns incense anymore, or essential oils. Dig a little deeper, and know, try to keep up with what you're looking for. These are probably a year old, so. I couldn't even tell you that these are the latest and greatest, but it's, some of them look like this, but they have this sort of big cartridge attached to them. Those are really popular. They also cost about 300 bucks. This one that I'm holding right here costs like $250. This is sort of your higher end one versus, you know, your e-cigarette, typical, I don't even know if I have any. What you find, or what I find, is that people tend to refer to these as the e-cigarettes, the jewels, and the ones that actually look like cigarettes, the little you know, cylinders. And then they would call this a vape, you know, the big machines that, that um, the kids buy offline. Uh, and an interesting, th a part, or an interesting thing that I learned when I was working up at the high school is that not only is this like a, an addiction, it's become a hobby for a lot of kids. There, there's a whole hobby behind modifying these things to make the most smoke that you can, which if you paid attention for two seconds, knows you're just making it worse for yourself. But that's an entire hobby. You ever been behind somebody in traffic and their, their sunroof is open and all of a sudden it seems like a volcano went off in their car? That's like it's cool for some reason. So they're taking these things and modifying them. It's a whole hobby. You can watch YouTubes about them. So as if these weren't bad enough, your kids are going online and watching YouTube videos about how to make them even worse. Um, Again, if I, if I could give you any advice, I would just say try to keep as updated as you can about what these things are looking like, because I think that's our biggest challenge. Yeah? Um, I know that these things can lead to like, cancer, but is there any more like, big diseases that they can lead to? Well, I mean, I couldn't tell you the medical stuff, but kids that do this stuff and, and get into THC vaping, and it is stronger. Um, I, I just, I'll answer your question in a second. Has anybody ever heard of dabs? Dabs is a wax form of marijuana that you can also put in this and it melts, and it's very strong. We actually had uh, an incident over this past weekend for Darien kids. Um, dabs are supposed to be used in a vape like this. They actually put it into some edible stuff and ate a large amount of it and basically had an overdose type situation on THC. To answer your question, Yes, you know how you, you ever heard somebody say marijuana is like a gateway drug? What they mean by that is not that you're gonna, you know, the first time anybody ever uses marijuana, they're addicted. You start using it a little, then you start using it a little more, and then you start using it a lot, and then it goes into other things. It's just, I don't like to use gateway, I like to use like starter. It's your starter thing. So yes, these things can lead to much worse things down the road. And then you get into the really, really bad stuff. It's like the beginning of the bad path. Yeah. Can this cause like bronchitis and stuff? Probably. <laughs> yes, it can cause bronchitis. I, I'm, kids, I'm sure you heard them, kids are dying. And not even just from the marijuana part, just from the vaping. They're, they're literally dying. Yeah? Do the vaping detectors work? I couldn't tell you. I'm guessing they do if they sell them and if the kids broke them, they were working. But. <laughs> And listen, I, I'll tell you this much, they're doing everything they can up at the high school and anywhere else. You literally have to catch a kid red-handed. There's really no other way around it. Because if I blow smoke into the air and you walk in two seconds later, that's, that, that smoke is gone and it doesn't smell. Mm -hmm. But I guess, does the vaping detector, have, what's the range? Because it has to be close enough. I guess you'd have to be in a room. You know, you can't just stick them in the hallway and hope. They're doing, trust me, if there was something we could tell them, anybody up there that would work, they would do it tomorrow. Because it's, it's an issue. And again, not just that's where they are all day, they're doing it other places too. Uh, wherever kids gather. <laughs> what? Could you use something like, um, so carbon, carbon monoxide is like the silent killer. Mm -hmm. Something that you can't smell. Could you use similar technology? 
uh, you're talking way out of my wheelhouse, but I'm guessing somebody, yeah, well, that's what those detectors are. They work. The problem is the kids are, again, what are you gonna station somebody next to each monitor, you know, detector, so make sure the kids don't break it? It's tough, it's, it's, it's tough. So again, I just wanted to touch quickly on the, the detection and the law enforcement part from our perspective. I'm gonna have this stuff up here. I think we have one more presenter, but I'll, I'll kind of stand around it at the end and feel free to poke around. Thank you, James. Yep. Um, rather than having another presenter, I think what I'd like to do is invite our guests, our speakers here to mm -hmm. sit at the head table. Also joining us tonight is, um, is a pediatrician. Um, Dr. Todd Malker with the New England Pediatrics Stanford, who can help answer some of the questions. One of the things that I think is so unique about the um, data is how deeply one can ingest the smoke into their lungs as opposed to smoking a joint or smoking a cigarette or smoking some other form of burning device because. I mean, all those old cartoons, you know, the shows with Cheech and Chong smoking pot and all that, they always end up coughing because you can only get so much into your lungs. With these vaping devices, you can total the deepest depths of your lungs, which in part is one of the reasons why we're seeing these uh, infections, uh, the respiratory infections, as, as pronounced as they've gotten. Um, and with that, please, <coughs> Our team from house here to answer questions that you may have other than the ones you've already asked. And if you have anything to add. Yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just add a couple things. So I'm a pediatrician. I work uh, in local towns. I know a lot of kids in this area. Uh, so I start talking to kids at age 13 usually because that's usually when I have parents step out uh, and I ask. And, and I usually start with uh, anyone you know vape or smoke or anything like that. And I kind of lead to, you know, do you. Uh, and what I hear is uh, from from kids, and a lot of kids are pretty honest because they know it's 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 not going to get out of the room. And I make it clear I'm not going to go tell their parents, which I love to, but I, I don't and I can't. Uh, but what I hear is I do hear that it starts a little bit in the middle school, but most of the middle schoolers I talk to are like, oh, I've heard of, I've heard a kid who does it, but I don't really know them. Uh, at the high school level, there's definitely a lot of people. Uh, I ask about oh, cigarettes. No, I don't. I can't remember the last time I had a teenager tell me about smoking cigarettes. Uh, but vape, obviously, you know, vape is a lot more common. Uh, a couple. Yeah. You know, once in a while when someone else has it. Uh, you know, things like that. So it's definitely in the community. Uh, one thing that I was, I was commenting before is that uh, over the last month, one thing I've heard several times is, and this is from kids in local schools, I don't remember which school specifically, that they think that there has been some decline because this is all this stuff about Evali is actually getting publicized and it's actually, uh, it is affecting kids. And I don't know, again, I, I can't, this is not a study, this is just anecdotally. Uh, kids are kids are saying, yeah, you know, I've never done it, but I, I'm hearing kids doing it a little bit less because, because of these reasons. Uh, so a couple years ago or last year, I would tell people when I would talk about this that, you know, you know, vaping might not be as bad as cigarettes. And I would use the analogy of, you know, jumping out of a 20th story window is pretty bad. You know, jumping out of 15 stories, you might say is better, but that's where vaping is, but I can't say it's significantly better. You know, it's still pretty bad for you. Uh, and what I've said over the last couple months, and I don't know all the pathophysiology, and I don't really under—I don't know why it's happening, but I do know uh, that what I'm telling people now is, look, it's at any amount, it's not safe. And so, whereas you know, before I was saying, look, you know, make sure you're not doing it a lot, you know, kind of talk about safety, because I understand telling someone just don't do it is not always going to work, and just talking about how to do something at least a little bit more safely and obviously trying to reiterate they shouldn't be doing it all. But with, with now what I'm telling them is, look, I don't think at this point until we know what's going on, any amount is safe. Uh, and that's kind of the message I'm trying to sending. And like I said, from what I'm hearing from some of the kids, that message, not necessarily from me, but is, is getting out to kids. So hopefully, uh, I know there's a lot of bad stuff, but hopefully on, on the good note, that might be something that, that we're seeing. And the only other thing I wanted to add is, you know, he had a list of, you know, how you know if your kids are vaping. Uh, the one thing I would add is ask them, uh, you know, just have a discussion with them about it. Talk to them about, are their friends, you know, you can start it off, oh, do you know, I just heard about this stuff called vaping, you know, do you know anyone who does it? Just kind of ease into it and flat out ask them. You know, some kids, you know, some kids are pretty good liars. Some, 
some aren't and some are kind of hem and haw and, and will and you can at least tell and then you can have that kind of face to face discussion about it about how it's not safe and kind of give them those facts that they might not be getting. So uh, just talk to people about it. Yes, fine. Question? So um, do these things like you guys showed me a picture of like the vape, like kinda like see, like all these little particles and stuff. It looked like there was like something in the back. Do those things ever like explode somehow? Like with like the different chemicals and stuff and then like mix together and like kinda like or, like sort of little flame or explodes sort of? Or, yeah. uh, uh, uh. With e-cigarettes, um, there have been some explosions, but more based on the battery and the charger, and there have been some fires associated with it, and there's been facial burns where they could blow up in your face, and those were the problems with e-cigarette batteries. Uh, but the chemicals themselves, I haven't heard anything about explosions. So I have a question. Propylene glycol, what is that used for? I mean, I know that it's a delivery in as you said, in the actual e-cigarette itself. But what other applications is propylene glycol used for? And how safe is it just as a delivery device to inhale? Well, it, it, you might be most familiar with it if you um, ever had a haunted house and you had uh, the smoke. Uh, or you know what looks like smoke in a haunted house, or you know sometimes in theater they'll have like look like clouds, and and that's propylene glycol vapor. Uh, it was never meant to be inhaled, um, and uh, but now they they felt it was fairly inert when they used it as a uh, a solution to mix the nicotine in. Um, it turns out that. The byproducts are, are formaldehyde and acetaldehyde, which I mentioned before. Um, but, um, you know, it, it was never meant to be inhaled, really. And one comment I just want to make is to make clear, e is not an infection. e is is the, is a, a your, your lung trying to protect itself with an immune reaction from the oil that is being inhaled. And that's what's giving the... Uh, the, um, uh, the terrible lung disease that we're seeing. Question? Is there any way to reverse the damage that occurs when you get the valley, or is it you're just stuck with like So again, you know, it's just pretty clear, it's pretty uh, uh, new. Um, the recommendations, uh, if we know somebody has E-Valley, say they have a, a they, they uh, you know, they got a flu shot and their flu swab is negative and their viral panel is negative, there's nothing infectious. The recommendation is give them prednisone, cortisone, for two weeks to try to help the healing. Um, uh, people, then you see 33 people and probably more by, we'll find out on Thursday, um, have died from this. Um, most, our patients, the patients who all came to the hospital have all left. Uh, we don't have any follow-up. Um, they're gonna need to get you know, breathing tests to see if there's been any permanent lung damage. Um, we hope not, but we don't know. It's is a you know it's a whole new disease process that we're just learning about. In the middle here, please. Um, I had a question. I know we were talking about middle school, high school, but I know a lot of parents in the community have college kids coming home, and it's pretty prevalent with college students also. Um, like. Uh, the awareness with college students, is it just because we're focused on the younger kids to not have them start? Or what is any advice about college kids that you know are vaping? Advice so, for college kids. So I think college is tough because one, a lot of places it's legal. So you can't from the law if it's still 18 in those states. Uh, two is they're exposed to a lot. Uh, a lot of these kids, even before, like I said, I had very few high school kids who were smoking cigarettes. I still had college kids who were. Uh, they would smoke when they would drink. They would smoke when they would go out. They didn't consider themselves smokers, but they considered themselves kind of social smokers. And I'm seeing that a lot with vaping. So there's a lot of what kids consider themselves to be social vapors. So it's, you know, well, you know, I vape a couple times a week when I have a drink or something like that. Um, so I think education, I mean, as, as you know, the, the, the college age brain is not necessarily able to kind of comprehend 
future and risks, and that's why they do a lot of stupid things. But I think that just trying to have that discussion about the dangers of it uh, is, is really kind of the key there because you're not with them. They're on their own. They have access to it legally in a lot of places. And so it's a really, it's, it's a little bit tougher at, at that age to have the control, but just trying to give them the education. Yeah, I, does, does, does anybody know that age when we go from feeling invincible to all of a sudden thinking there are vulnerabilities in life with some of the things that we do? I mean, you know, so. Well, for boys, I mean, for boys, they talk about, you know, the frontal lobe doesn't fully develop till 25, which is why young men do stupid things. Women mature a little bit earlier, but that's why a lot of, I mean, you see all the stuff you do and at, at that age is a lot of stupid things that aren't just vape related, but a lot of that. There's a question about Yeah, well, I was just wondering, um, with the prevalence of using uh, inhalers, albuterol, et cetera, and so many people and children are in the inner city school, where so many children have asthma and are using inhalers, um, normalizing this kind of thing in, in the society, you know, as a, uh, a good option for asthma, um, does that, do you think, um, help or make it more legitimate for these other kids to start vaping, you know, it, or should we, in health education, start differentiating very early the use of an albuterol or an inhaler as a, a medical intervention versus something that is really unhealthy? I wonder if that would... That's interesting. I've, I've never thought of it that way. The question, I don't know if you heard, is what about, you know, we condone using inhalers for asthma, um, so, you know, why is a student sitting next to the asthmatic, you know, think maybe it's uh, unhealthy to inhale something else? That's the question. Um, I've never, I've, I've seen very clever devices. One thing I thought you were getting at was, have they devised vaping to look like a, a, a mutadose inhaler for asthma, which uh, I'm sure they will if they haven't. Um, but uh, I think it's just education. I mean, the inhalers for asthma go through a lot of scrutiny. They're FDA approved. There's a lot of safety records. It's, you know, inhaling and inhaling. It's, it's really, you know, two totally different things. I think you just have to emphasize that one has been looked at and one is safe and one has been looked at and is not safe. Yeah, <laughs> and that's... Yeah, I, I think it's a, a pretty basic education that, you know, you can start with and go from there. Another question from anybody? Um, as a parent wanting to understand the money trail, um, you mentioned the devices could be really expensive, but how much would they be spending on refills? Like, a, it, it depends who you're talking about, like from a store or the kind that they're getting from Colorado. Just in general, like what kind of money flows should parents be looking for? They're not cheap. Um, you know, a box of jewel pods could be twenty-five bucks, thirty bucks. You know, how, how many how many jewels are in a are in a box? I want to say like twelve pods. And that's the other thing. And I don't know if you guys would comment on this. I think there's a difference based on what I know anyway about you know how much how many cigarettes are in a pod, you know, versus you know smoking cigarettes. I, I don't know the answer, but I'm guessing the kids vape quicker than they would smoke. So, so a pod is the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes as far as the nicotine content. Yeah. Uh, one thing I did hear is that the, the more experienced you are at, at using the devices, the actual more, the more you actually draw in. You're talking about kind of that. So very kind of inexperienced, just like if, you know, people who it's kind of similar to, to traditional smoking is you, you're able to take a bigger draw in, you're able to get more of that chemical in. So kind of the more experience you get, you're actually getting more of it in to you. Of whatever it is. Of whatever it is. Or nicotine or... Well, it, it turns out, actually, the, the Juul in particular and some, some of the other e-cigarettes, they're using nicotine salts, which are actually absorbed even more quickly. And the fear is that although, you know, the, the conversion is supposed to be one pod um, is equal to a pack of cigarettes, the, the fear is that there's more nicotine um, absorbed in the end uh, from these jewels because they're using a nicotine salt that's better absorbed than routine nicotine. I just want to make a point. Some people get confused about jewel. I've had a lot of parents ask me what the question, what is jewel? Jewel is just a brand name for a different kind of vape. It just got very popular because it looks like a USB drive. It's like Kleenex is a tissue. It, jewel is just another vape mechanism. 
I think a lot of people thought Juul was some sort of drug. Yeah. But wait, just really quick, among from what I see among kind of people starting out, it tends to be the more popular yeah, one, yeah. though, because it's... It was cool for all... It still is cool. Yeah. Yeah. How long, Sorry. Take, Sorry. how long does it take to... How many puffs in a, in a Juul pot? How long does it take to... Go through it? Yeah. I think, I think it has a lot 20. of people taking how much are you, you know, doing a little puff for you yeah. like like a cigarette would be. Oh, no. There's probably people that could finish a cigarette in two drags, you know. I it all depends on how quickly, how much. But how like you know. Well, you could probably take any depending on how much you suck in, anywhere from you have know, twenty to fifty drags on a, a pod, sometimes more if they're taking small little puffs. So it, it's it's hard to quantitate because the way it's being used is so different. Yes. Hi there, two questions. Can they order a vape with THC in it from Colorado and have it, have it delivered to their mechanic? Yes. The question was, and this is important, can they order a cartridge with THC in it from Colorado and have it delivered to their home in Connecticut? And the answer is yes. Yes. Not just THC oil, edibles, all kinds of stuff. Now the other question is the other question is you said it's difficult to find uh, evidence, but if you were to find a pen or a vape, what are you what are what can you do legally about that? So typically we would test it because we can't just tell by looking at it, just like any of you, is this nicotine or is this THC? So <coughs> if we have to break open one of the pods and, and test it in the field with we have these chemical tests, but it's not something we can just look at. And I just wanted to make a point that I, I meant to before. I think a lot of confusion with kids comes because we're in this like transition period with pot and THC. Is it legal? Is it not legal? And in Connecticut, marijuana for 18, if you've been 18 or older, has been decriminalized, which means, and this is another issue we're having, Personal use amounts are legal for somebody over the age of 18. Now, what does that mean in jewel cartridges? I couldn't tell you. I can give you the weight that you can have in, in, in marijuana, but jewel cartridge, I have no idea. Are we weighing the jewel cartridge? So that's, that's an issue. If you're under the age of 18, it's a misdemeanor crime, just like it was 10 years ago. So kids are getting in trouble for THC pods. They're getting arrested for that if they have THC, if they test positive for THC. But adults if they have a personal use amount. So if you're in high school... It's a fine, I'm sorry, it's a fine. It's not a crime anymore. You still get, you can get a ticket. So if you're in high school and, and you're caught smoking bacon, sorry, um, what happens? They test it to see if it has THC in it, and then depending on that, usually if it has THC in it, it's turned over to us, the youth detectives, to follow up on that? later. You can get arrested for it. Um, what happens? When you get arrested? Like, what happens to the kid? They go to Stanford Court. Okay. Yeah. It's a, it's a crime. It's a misdemeanor it's a crime, crime no, state. I don't think that kids should know about that. that I, think, I think there's a lot of confusion because they hear decriminalized and all of a sudden, oh, it's, it's a free-for-all. It'd be great if this could, could be known, you know, and That's what we're trying you guys to. could go to, high, to the high school. We do. Yeah. Oh, okay. The vaping devices themselves are confiscated regularly. Yes, yeah, so that's where I got all those. So that's, that's, that's one question, yeah. I think, is what happens to the vaping devices that are found? They're all confiscated. Now, I don't know that all of them are tested. Oh, yeah. Nowadays, they, they are tested. testing them all. So. But just to speak on that briefly, I mean, alcohol is also illegal for kids under 21, but they're still used. I mean, it's not that. It, it's not that big of a deterrent mm -hmm. for them to not use just because they it is a crime. And those laws have been on the books for alcohol for since we were kids, you know. So that's not necessarily the biggest deterrent to them. Could they be arrested uh, under the influence of alcohol at the court? If a kid has alcohol, like they have, they're in possession of alcohol, yes. Um, so as a kid, like, what are we supposed to like, look at for, like, on the streets? You'd be like, I don't know, like, you just like see a guy, like be like, no, like get out of that area, like kind of like sketchy sort of. Like, like any like signs that you should like know about, to, like sort of like get out of the area. So I think you're asking like, what what do you do if you're confronted with it, sort of thing. Yeah. I think it's important for you to know that there's not like these pushy 
vape dealers anywhere in town. The kids that you're gonna have to worry about are probably your friends that, for one reason or another, try it and then they're trying to get you to try it. You're not gonna get approached on a street corner and have somebody try to force it on you. It's gonna be your friends, unfortunately. One of them that starts doing it is gonna tell you it's, I don't know, it tastes good because it tastes like vanilla mango. And that's where you gotta kind of draw the line. That's, that's a really good point too, you know, is that the um, biggest influences are our friends in our environment. And if it's going on all around us, and you know, as kids, it's sometimes it can be hard to say no, but keep yourself safe. That's what you have to do. Yes, sir. I'm just kind of struck it, it, at least from what I've heard, it doesn't really sound like the students in town are really, you know, getting education in the school about, you know, like, you know, presentations on, you know, they're, they're getting loads of marketing, you know, they're seeing these cool looking products coming out that look like they're coming from Apple or Google or something. But, you know, lack of education, you know, there's, you know, a lot of hardworking kids in this town who are hungry for information every day. And take it in and then it's their you know, decision whether they're going to listen to it and follow it. But I think that right now they're kind of operating in a vacuum, it seems to me. You know, and that there's stuff just in the delivery of, of the stuff in your lungs, you know, lead, nickel, benzene, I mean, you know, formaldehyde, you know, take, forget the, you know, nicotine and forget the THC and whatever else someone's decided to, you know, try and get into this pots, you know. But it just seems to me that people are operating, you know, with, you know, it's, it's up to us as parents who are bringing our kids to these, you know, presentations to educate the kids. But I mean, like, like let's invest in our kids in the schools and be it, you know, MMS and DHS and, um, you know, give them as much information and at least give them chance to to go at it with, with some information and they make a mistake after that you know. there's a little bit of good news and I'm just speaking my experience with the school um, so they they transitioned away from this this program they used to have with, around substance abuse and now they do these um, in the high school anyway I don't I couldn't tell you about the middle school now they do these mandatory presentations and I was involved with them the first couple of years and we talked about marijuana laws and then the, the effect of alcohol on the brain. Well, they're, they're catching up now and now part of these presentations that the kids have to go to every, every fall are they had a whole vaping session, a vaping informational session. So, and the other thing I wanted to point out like the doctor uh, down here said is that I think now that unfortunately kids are dying, it's getting a little bit more attention than it, than it did. If you were three years ago, I would have said you're a hundred percent right. It's, Unfortunately, again, when, when people get hurt and die, we start to catch up. And I think that's starting to happen. And I, again, I can only speak for this town. So middle school, I, I agree with you. I, I'd rather give them the information before they start seeing it. Um, and, and to follow up on your, your question about what are our schools doing for um, informing and getting this message out to students, I did meet with uh, Dr. Abbott, superintendent of schools, to discuss how we can enhance an awareness program through the school system yeah. for vaping and for other risky behaviors, you know, whether it be binge drinking, you know, drinking in general, um, you know, so we have started a dialogue on how we might be enhancing and modifying the, school, uh, the curriculum to include more instead of just a one day session or a couple of hours once a year. Yeah, they're, they're, re they're retooling their entire health program right now. I know that for a fact. Right? Yeah, I mean, because on the surface, you look at these things, they look absolutely harmless. They look, you know, right. they're, they're just as cool as, you know, whatever the latest iPhone release is, whatever. It's a social thing. I know that I think the depot, um, they're opening the um, SADD, the Students Against Destructive Decisions. They're opening a chapter for the eighth grade this year, so hopefully it will be a topic. Um, I'm a district employee, and sadly, I'm mentioned that I did find two pods at an elementary school last year. Um, we were out actually with our school class collecting materials and I had no idea what it was and 
I was just, you know, shocked when we brought the materials we found on the playground into the classroom for this art project. I said, I think this is odd, and we didn't address it with our preschoolers, <coughs> but you know, the staff was pretty shocked at the elementary school. I mean, we thought, you know, it could have been a character or parents pod. We don't know. <coughs> for a student, but we, we just couldn't confirm anything. But at the elementary school, we did discover the pods. And just really quick to comment. Kids, you know, telling them there's lead or cadmium, it, that tends to have less effect than telling them some other things. So, so one of the things with these education programs is, I remember an old study I saw on smoking, and if you're talking to teenagers about smoking, you know, yeah, lung cancer, you know, 40 years down the road, wrinkles, like that's what kind of, so you have to, no, this was, this was true. It, wrinkles is, you know, when they said wrinkles, they're like, oh man, I don't want to get, so you really have to look at, at what, so I don't think that telling a kid there's lead and cadmium is necessarily going to be like, oh, that's why I'm not going to do it. So people dying and ending up in the hospital, I think, you know, that's one of those things that, that might that might do it. You know, I talked to athletes about about their lungs and about lung damage and lung capacity and, and why would they inhale substance in their lungs when they're doing that. Uh, and I and, and kind of I, I think sometimes focusing on the things that kids think about a little bit more rather than trying to go through this, you know, if they watch this, you know, if you show this slide presentation to an eighth grader about the lung damage, it, it doesn't, you know, kind of showing that some of that isn't as effective as, as some of the other stuff. So yeah, I guess my point was, you know, the, the whole thing starts out bad. And it only gets worse oh, no, absolutely. Because it's just a Russian roulette with whatever you're getting, which you have no idea, you know, what you're getting when you're lying. Right. Right. Well, I mean, the whole issue with when I was doing these talks, you know, about vaping for years has been how bad it is. Just the issues we're talking about getting addicted to nicotine. And the silver lining is that the deaths have called a lot of attention to this. And there's a lot more discussion. I mean, we're here tonight um, there. You know, hope, so hopefully that momentum will continue and, you know, the education will continue. And and it certainly has to be at the mid school, middle school level. Um, I used to give tobacco cessation lectures at the high school level, um, and it was probably too late for many of these people. I would have been better off, so now I try to do it at the middle, middle school level, and that's where the vape lectures have to be. And, and I think the teachers are doing their best to you know, get the uh, information out there. Um, it's just it's a cultural phenomenon, um, and uh, you know, it's, it seems like you know, every generation has their you know, thing to deal with, and, and this is the current one. It's so hard to put vaping detectors in the high schools. Why don't they just put in those um, the, the things that they have in the airports where they can, you know, scan people? Uh, I think you get a lot of pushback on that. Um, I'm not disagreeing with you, but you're going to get a lot of upset people if you want to put body scanners at the. I mean, it's like in Darien High School. You launched this initiative like the one we had in Darien and Darien drop it, like the Oh, the drop it and drive. Darien, no vaping. You can just do it for the whole therapy yeah. And one more question, and then I'd like to open it up to have people come up and take a look at these things. Um, and I, I'd like to say that uh, um, I was just recently at a presentation done where um, a mom was confronted by a uh, a resource officer in another community, and you know her son had uh, a vaping device confiscated. And when the officer presented the mother with what that vaping device was, she said, "Well, that's his laser pointer." Oh. Well, it wasn't a laser pointer, uh, but that's what these things look like. And so, you know, you just have to know what's going on. I mean, it's hard to be so intrusive all the time. It's a lot of work. I mean, I've been, I was a parent. I know what it's like. It's hard, you know, but it is hard. Yeah. You have to pay attention. Yeah, One last perfect. question. Um, when there's THC and they're vaping that, does that have the same effect or potentially on the brain or, uh, you know, behavioral changes or hallucinosis or something delivered in that form versus a uh, smoking pot to a pipe or something? Paper? You're asking the difference between vaping THC or smoking THC? Does that oil in it mitigate the effects? No, I, I think it's pretty much the same. Um, yeah, it's just a more uh, um, elusive way of doing it, but I think the end result is the same. And, and as I said before, I think you can draw more in. 
the earth right. because it's not as hot yeah. as when you're burning, you know, when you're breathing in something that's burning. And you don't know the quantity because you yeah. don't know how much somebody's put in there. Yeah. You don't know the quantity. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank our panelists.